Amen. All right. Uh, of course, we concluded Genesis chapter number 25 last week. We read the very famous story that took place with Jacob and Esau, where Esau sold his birthright uh, to Jacob. Now we're going to begin here in, in Genesis chapter number 26, and this is really the, uh, the first real close look that we get at Isaac's life. So it's not really that's, that's recorded or talked about prior to this. I mean, he's mentioned, of course, you have uh, Abraham sending forth his servant to bring back a wife for uh, Isaac previous to this. But a lot of his life really isn't discussed. You don't see him engaging. You don't see him speaking much prior to this. So this is really one of the very first looks we're going to get at Isaac and what type of person he is. One thing that I want you to, and it's going to continually come up, so I will touch on this repeatedly, but I'll give you a quick overview of what I, one of the things that I purge or take away from this chapter, and it's the impacts from generation to generation. It's how one generation reacts to the things that they were taught, the things that they were learned, all of those types of things, and then also we're going to see uh, we're going to see negatives that that are passed down, blessings, things along those lines. So just keep that in mind. Impacts from generation to generation. That actually begins here with the context of verse number one. Genesis twenty six verse number one says this, and there was a famine in the land beside the first famine. That was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went, went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. Verse 2. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Now there in verse number 1 we see right to begin with that Isaac has a very similar situation that takes place with Abraham. And it even references the famine that Abraham experienced in his lifetime. And we see this happening all throughout the Bible. We preached, of course, through the book of Ruth. And we saw it in the very beginning of the life of Elimelech and Naomi, didn't we? And what happened? They had a famine, and then they ended up leaving or fleeing. And there's a common theme throughout the Bible. When someone has some sort of trial or tribulation, you know what they always do? They run away, or they flee away. Now, how did it work out for Elimelech and Naomi? Bad, didn't it? How did it work out for Abraham the first time that he did it? Bad, didn't it? He, about, he, he almost caused himself, of course, he would be involved, and his wife to commit a very grievous sin. So, it, it's a very strong representation, and even really in reality, and in relation to his life, it's the truth, that when a person is within God's will, don't go anywhere. Even when things get rough and tough, don't go anywhere. Amen. Even when you're having problems and trials and tribulations, don't go anywhere. Because let me promise you this, you'll have famines. You'll have problems. You'll have trouble. You know why this is going on in Abraham's life and it goes on in Isaac's life as well? Because every generation has problems. Every generation has troubles. Famines are serious. People die. You lose your children. You don't have food. There's a lack or a shortage of food supply where people don't have food to the point where people feel like they have to leave. They're getting, you know what's happening? They're getting scared. Now you think people people end up starting they, they they begin to travel when they're completely out of food or before that? When the, the, don't you think that they, they that they have they feel like they have some sort of foresight and then they're like, wow, we better get out of here, right? Now, in this case, with Isaac, where was Abraham told to go? To the promised land, wasn't he? Where, was, where is Isaac supposed to be? The promised land. That represents God's will. And sometimes, even when you're within God's will, you have problems. Sometimes, even when you're within God's will, there are tribulations and trials. There are famines. And you know what you do? You don't run away from your troubles. You don't run away from your famine. You don't want to run away from your problems because oftentimes there's consequences with that. Oftentimes, things are going to be worse when you stop following God's will. When you get outside of God's will, it's a perfect example of church. Some people can, and we, we of course, I hope will never experience this. Sometimes, they're, they're, you, know, you may go to a church or uh, you, may, you may hear about a church where people have a really bad like church experience. Where maybe something really bad happens with the pastor. Think of Jack Scott. I mean, if anybody needs their name named, it's him. 
to discussing pervert at First Baptist Church of Canada, Indiana. What happened with him? Imagine that guy being your pastor for 15 years and something like that happened. You don't think people were tempted to leave church? I'm sure that they were. I'm positive that they were. They had, of course, a, a, a wicked, evil man that they were sitting under for years and years and years, and that's discouraging. You're thinking, oh, I have to question everything I've learned. I have to question all these things, all these problems. But weren't they by going to church in, in, in the sense of just assembling themselves with other believers and going there in their heart to hear the Word of God? Don't you believe they were still within God's will going to church? Of course, you're commanded to go to church. You're commanded to congregate, right? Amen. Don't you think it'd be easy just to fall out of church if something like that happened? Don't you think it'd be easy just to maybe move to Egypt, right? Or to go to Gerar? Of course it would. It'd be very easy just to leave and flee. But guess what? Things end up. If you lean upon your own understanding, oftentimes the end of that's worse. You try to use your own wisdom and your own knowledge and try to you know, make your own decisions in areas like that and things end up being a lot worse than, than if you were to just trust in God. If God. Because here's the thing, we, we serve an all-powerful God, don't we? But don't you believe that He's able to keep you and provide for you and, 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 and you know, preserve you through these famines? Yeah, well then just stay in Canaan. Just stay in the promised land. This is the attitude that we need to take away from when we see people making mistakes with you. Look at verse number 2 once more. It says, The Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. So just seeing that, do you think that it was a good idea when Abraham left? No. It was not, of course. Now, he's already now went into Gerar. And, of course, God in this case tells him, Just stay where you're at. You look there in verse number 3. It says, Sojourn in this land. And I will be with thee and will bless thee, for unto thee and unto thy seed I will give. And then he says, all these countries. Of course, talking about the neighboring countries. He's not referring to Gerar. Because the proof of that is very simply by comparing Scripture to Scripture. Is, is the land of the Philistines a part of Canaan? No. So, he's just referring to the neighboring cities. Because he doesn't give them... You know, Philistine. So he's obviously close by, or maybe he's just saying, I will give thee all these countries. And he knows that, that Isaac will understand the, the nearby countries. He doesn't want him, the point is this also, he doesn't want him fleeing all the way south to Egypt. He doesn't want him going all the way away from the land. He's still there in Gerar. And the reason why you oftentimes see the Philistines mentioned in battle with Israel is because they're neighboring. They're sitting right next to each other. So he's right there on the verge, and he's, he's not talking about the land of the Philistines, but he's saying, I'll give you all these countries. So it's the neighboring cities there. He's telling them, don't go down into Egypt. E Egypt is oftentimes a picture of the world. It's also a perfect picture of a person leaving church, again, leaving God's will, leaving just serving God on their own personally, reading the Bible, praying, and then going into the world. That's what he's telling them. Just don't go into Egypt. Whatever you do, don't go back, right? Amen. Look at verse 3. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries. And I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. Those are faithful words right there. Verse 4. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. And will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Verse 5. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Now, of course, in the Bible we see, and this is found in Ezekiel uh, many times where it's referring to the watchmen. This is a very popular a thing that people will talk about and will discuss amongst each other. And that is the idea of one person being punished for another person's sins. Now, the Bible is very, very clear, like as far as our salvation, as far as according to the law, people are not punished in that sense for someone else's sins. But there are inherent curses that will carry on from one generation to the next. Just like that, there are inherent blessings that will carry on from one generation to the next. Now, with that in mind, we see right here that it says in verse number 5, because, after he just told him about all the blessings, he says this again, verse 5, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So why are all these blessings coming upon Isaac in this situation? 
because of the great things that his, that his father did. Because of the great things that Abraham did. So let that set in, of course, parents and leaders of their family, dads and, and husbands. Your, those that are under you, your family just in general, your wives and your children are affected by you. You are impacting your children. And you are either going to leave your children a blessing, you are going to leave them an inheritance, a spiritual inheritance, or you could very well leave them a curse, sadly. I want you to go, let's look uh, at Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter number 20, this is fresh in my mind because you know, I recently had preached about memorizing the law of the Lord. So I had memorized Exodus 20 in the past, it's where the Ten Commandments are, so I went back and memorized that again recently because that was, that was fresh in my mind from the sermon. I was thinking about it as a commandment repeatedly. Look at the verses that are found here. Look at verse number look at verse number 5. <clears throat> it says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, speaking of idols. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. And then it said, Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And then it says in verse number 6, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So I want you to notice how that one person's sin can be passed down unto the next generation's can. One person living in a wicked life, one person living a very sinful life can affect those after them. Well, in the same token, in the, on the same you know, coin, just the other side, we have what? Abraham leaving a blessing for his children. Go back to, again, uh, Genesis chapter number 26. Genesis chapter number 26. Oftentimes people think that their own decision, especially when someone's making a selfish decision, especially when someone's making a poor decision in their life, choosing to commit some grievous sin, they don't think about how they're affecting others. They only think about how this could possibly affect them. But every decision that you make, especially big decisions, of committing you know, terrible sins, you're affecting your family. You're, you are a million percent affecting your family. And you're possibly bringing God's wrath upon your family. You're possibly bringing God's wrath to the next generation. You're, and not only that, you're teaching your children you know, uh, bad practices. You're, you're, you're setting them up to possibly make a, the same bad decision as yourself. So keep that in mind when you go to make a bad decision. It's not only you need to be afraid of God's wrath in your life, but maybe it will help you a little if you think about, hey, I don't want my kids going down the same path. So that's a, a short little small truth that we can learn from that. Look at verse number 6. It says, And Isaac dwelt in Gerar. So notice he stayed there, didn't he? He stayed put. Verse 7. And the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, She is my sister. For he feared to say, She is my wife. Lest, said he, that means like unless, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebecca because she was fair to look upon. Now, does this sound familiar? Of course, this is identical to what took place with Abraham when he went down to Abimelech before. And hopefully by this point, you've picked up on the reason why I said that this particular chapter is highly focused on generation to generation. So first, what did we see? We saw the famine that took place in Abraham's generation. It actually references that famine saying this is a different famine. What's it say? It was also a famine that took place in Isaac's generation. Right? Right after that, we see that because of Abraham's obedience and because of his uh, keeping of God's commandments, what happens to Isaac? There's a blessing that's passed down from generation to generation. Now, not only that, we get to verse number 7, and we see the next generation making the exact same decision as the previous generation. Do you see why we see a lot of the impacts from generation to generation in this chapter? Right there in the very beginning. Not only that, one thing I want to point out too in verse number 7, it says this, And the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, She is my sister. Now, where did he learn that? Take a guess. His father. You, don't, you, you know, you... You know, you can only speak of the things that you know and see, right? So he learned this from somewhere. He's doing this for a reason, and he saw someone else do it. Jacob and Esau were mentioned at the end of chapter number 25. They didn't go anywhere. Where do you think they are? Who are they with before, and who are they with after this? They're there with Isaac when he looks like he's on his deathbed. They're there with Isaac before chapter number 26. Where do you think, where do you think he, they are now? They're with their father. There's a famine. Where do you think Isaac was when Abraham went down there? 
is with his father. Where do you think he's getting this from? It's identical. I preached a sermon about learning from your mistakes, and this is like the epitome of that. This is like a perfect example of, a bad example of someone not learning from their mistakes where their father goes and does something, and, and it's a super close call where something very bad happens. And then that person's put in that same situation again, and they're so stupid to make the same decision. What is that like? It's like a dog returning to its vomit. That's what Isaac is like. He's like going back, well, let's try this once more, and hopefully we get a different result. That's stupidity, isn't it? It's the definition of, of someone that's a crazy person, you've heard said many times, I'm sure. What's the reason why he does it? What's the reason why anyone lies? It tells you right there. It says, he said, she is my sister. Why? For he feared to say, she is my wife. It's very interesting as well, if we cross-reference this with the story of the Bimelech, when God comes to Abimelech, you have that same exact situation taking place, right? Or, here, let me, I'll give you even a better example. When Sarah, as I pointed this out, you know, uh, when, we were, when we were in that particular chapter, when God, when Sarah laughs, what does God say? She calls her out on it, and what she said? I didn't laugh. Why? She was afraid. You see this parallel? You know why people you know, sin most of the time, why they lie, do things that they shouldn't do? Because they're afraid. Why did Isaac leave the land, do you think? Why do you think he left the land of Canaan? Because he was afraid. Because he was, he, he's, he's fearful of this famine to come. I'm sure it's the same reason why Elimelech caused his family to pack up and leave. Oftentimes, people will make bad decisions because they're allowing their feelings to guide them as opposed to the Word of God. Sometimes something may not even feel right to you, but that does not mean that it's not right. You know, the first time you maybe hear a doctrine taught that's foreign to you, and you hold a view that's in opposition, it doesn't feel right. Sometimes when you believe a particular thing in, in the Bible, and someone confronts you with something that's opposing to it, and you truly believe it, you can be wrong. I have plenty of people that believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. I have heard them say how uncomfortable it makes them when someone comes to them and says, hey, look at Matthew 24. Look at Revelation 6. Look at you know, 2 Thessalonians 1. You, how do you think it makes them feel on the inside? They're like, oh, man. Right? Because it bothers them. You, you know, of course, the truths are clear in the Bible, but it makes you feel uncomfortable. It makes you feel uneasy. Just because you're uncomfortable, just because you're, because you're uneasy doesn't mean that you should sway away from something or you should try to make another decision. You never allow your feelings to guide you. You know why? Because the Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. If you allow your heart to make decisions for you, you will be deceived, my friend. That's what will happen. If you allow your heart to guide you in life, you're just going to be making stupid decisions your whole life. You know what you need to do is allow God to guide you. <clears throat> you know what he should have done? God said stay in Canaan. You know what he should have done? I'm going to stay in Canaan. There's a famine coming, but you know what? God promised that this land is going to be ours. It's going to multiply. My seed, I'm staying in Canaan. Even when he got scared, he should have stayed in Canaan. Amen. Elimelech may have lived a lot longer if he would have stayed in Canaan. He wouldn't have just become afraid. So you can see here, what did Isaac do in this situation? Because he was afraid, he sinned. Oftentimes when you start allowing your feelings to make your decisions and to be the main factor, the primary factor on why you're doing what you're doing, you'll get into sin. Because you need to allow the Word of God to, to be a light under your path. You need to allow the Word of God to guide you. Finish there in verse number 8. <laughs> well, verse number 7, I don't believe we finished it. It says, She is my wife, lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebecca, because she was fair to look upon. Verse 8. And it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech King of the Philistines looked out of the window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. Sporting, of course, some maybe they were holding hands, I'm not exactly sure. Sporting is kind of, of course, like entertainment, if you will. So they're having fun together, is what that means. Holding hands, maybe kissing, something that shows that they are not just friends, right? Whatever it may be. And they're in public, so I'm sure they're not doing anything inappropriate. Holding hands or whatever it may be. Verse number 9. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety she is thy wife, and how sayest thou, she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, Now watch this. 
Lest I die for her. How's that sound? Lest I die for her. What's he doing? He's sacrificing his wife, basically, for himself. He's like, lest I die for her. Think about the words that he just came out of his mouth. That's terrible, isn't it? What kind of love is the man supposed to have for his wife? The exact opposite. Yeah, it's supposed to, he gets compared on the love that Christ had for the church, and he gave himself for it. So also should, should men love their own wives. Saying in the same way is a man supposed to love his own wife. You know what Isaac was willing to do? You know why? another reason why he sinned? He's being selfish. That's why. He's being selfish, and he said, So I lied lest I die for her. That's the same situation that we have with Abraham and Sarah, too. These are all great men of God in many ways. It just shows the sinful nature that they have. So this, what we need to take away from this is that we all have these same you know, uh, propensities to some degree, don't we? We all have these same you know, uh, 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 temptations to some degree to make bad decisions. So even when we can see a great man is lifted up like Abraham in the Bible, we need to take heed lest we fall ourselves, right? You know, it seems stupid when you read it on the onset, but if I had a record of your life and the decisions you made from the Holy Spirit's perspective, which is perfect truth, I bet there'd be a lot of stupid decisions in there too. So when we read these things, don't just say like, hey, this is stupid, I would never do that. We need to take heed lest we fall. That's what we need to do. Amen. So he says, lest I die for her. So, of course, it's a selfish decision. It's, not, it's never all right to lie. Look at verse number 10. And Abimelech said, what is this thou hast done unto us? One of the people might lightly have lied with thy wife, and thou shouldest have brought guiltiness upon us. Now, does everybody know the word like lightly or light means in the Bible? Like in this context? Give me an example of a word. It's like this. Am I lightly lying with thy wife? Casually. Casually, or something like that. Do you hear it? With, when he, do you see how like the heathen live their life? It's 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 disgusting. It's, I read that every time, and I'm like, who should be lightly lying with anybody? Just like casually, like you said, or just like not a big deal, right? That's what it means, like lightly. It's not heavy. It's not. It doesn't have a lot of content. That's why. That's that's a, the way to picture this in your mind. That's what it means that for something to be lightly, right? Saying there's not a lot there, there's not a lot to it. It doesn't really matter that much, right? You know, to them. You know, that obviously, and that's the, where our society is going today, where, you know, no longer do women have, you know, their, their purity anymore, but it's just people are just lightly lying with, with one another all the time, which is not okay. This is how heathen live. This is not how, you know, people of God should live. So, no one should be lightly lying with anybody, right? It's a ridiculous statement. But it says, lightly I'm lying with thy wife. And then he says, and thou shouldest have brought guiltiness upon us. Further proving, we learn the same truth when we look at the parallel passage to this with Abraham making the same stupid mistake. We learn the same truth, and that is this. That, at the end it says, shouldest should have brought guiltiness upon, what is it, him or us? Shouldest have, have brought guiltiness upon us, even if they didn't know that that was Isaac's wife, it was still wrong. He's saying, by you deceiving us and telling us that she's not your wife, if we would have believed you and then taken your wife and committed this act with her, right? Maybe even if they married her, it would have been wrong, wouldn't it have? That's what he's saying. So even, here's the point, this is what they're saying. They knew that even if they weren't aware, right? Even if they, if they knew that even if they weren't aware, that this was Isaac's wife, if they would have done this, it would have been sin. The Bible talks about, throughout the law, that there is sinning through ignorance and then sinning presumptuously. There is when you sin willingly or knowingly, and you just know something's wrong, and then you do it anyways. But then there's also sinning ignorantly. That's why David prays in the book of Psalms, and he says, Cleanse thou me from secret faults. What does he mean? He's saying, from sins I don't even know that I have. Because I'm committing sins every day and I don't even know it. So it's stupid when people say, you know, if, well, if you say that to so-and-so and you didn't know that it wasn't true, it's okay. No, it's not. That's why you shouldn't just go around and just like, you know, the Bible says that a fool utters everything that's in his heart. A fool utters his mind, right? You, that's why you shouldn't be saying things unless you're positive that they're true. You should, that's why this should uh, push us to learn and know the Word of God better and know the commandments of God better because we may be sinning ignorantly or sinning you know, without knowing. 
And we shouldn't be doing that. So this, this is a further proof that even prior to the law being given, people understood that you could sin ignorantly. Without even knowing it, this still would have been a sin because they would have been guilty. Also, this is the same truth we learned in that, in that story of Abraham and, and uh, Abimelech previous. Look at verse 11. And Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He that toucheth this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. So if someone were to have touched his wife, obviously this applies to the man too. But he says, if you were to touch this man or his wife, and this was in regards to someone possibly committing adultery with his wife, said that they would surely be put to death. Well, we saw in the past uh, uh, story of this with Abraham and Sarah, we saw when God came to Abimelech, what did he tell him? Behold, thou art a dead man. Why? Because he was going to be committing adultery, showing that that's a punishment for adultery. We see something very similar here. Look well, at verse 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year an hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Now, this is a powerful verse I want to focus on for a moment. Number one, I want you to look at those words there. It says, then Isaac sowed in, what does it say? That land. What land? Go back to verse number, go back to verse number three. Look at verse number 2 first. The Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land. Then you skip forward, you look at verse number 12, and it says, Then Isaac sowed in that land. Where is he? He's exactly where God told him to be, isn't he? That's what it's referring to when it says that land. It's the land that God told him to be in, and what land was it? He said, This land, this land of here are there, right? Notice what happened as a result of, them, of, of Isaac being in the will of God. Look at verse number 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land, and it says, and received in the same year an hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. What's a hundredfold? You get some proud participation. It's, I realize it's the middle of the week, but wake up. What's, what's the, uh, what is a hundredfold? A hundred times. A hundred times, right? Okay, so I want you to, a lot of things just blow over your head sometimes. So if he started with one sheep, how many did he have at the end of the year? 100. Okay. If he started with one, you know, uh, grain of wheat, how many did he have at the end of the year? You know, uh, one bushel, let's say. A hundred bushels, right? You understand the multiplication that's taking place here? If he started with one, you know, uh, uh, what's a currency in the Bible? Give me a currency, anything. Sickle. A shekel. One shekel of gold. How many did he have at the end? A hundred shekels of gold. He has been blessed amazingly when it comes to far as financial prosperity here. This is like, like you know, something that's miraculous, isn't it? He, he was blessed a hundred times. You are given this exact same, this exact same blessing in the New Testament. Did you know that? Turn to Matthew chapter number 19, verse number 29. Matthew chapter number 19, verse number 29. Matthew chapter number 19, verse number 29. Look at verse 28 too. Now, actually, let's back up some. Look at verse number 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, says this, shall receive an hundredfold, and then it says, and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. That's a powerful blessing right there, my friends. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and preach like uh, like a Joel Osteen prosperity gospel, right? That's not what I'm going to preach because the New Testament, there's a lot of persecutions, even more so than the Old Testament. The Old Testament. The Bible talks about how these blessings can be. If you look at a parallel of this, I didn't put it in my Bible. I think it's in Luke, the one that says this, that in this life and in the life to come, right? So I believe that these types of blessings can come in many different ways. They can, you can be blessed a hundredfold in many different ways. But either way, because you can look at people like Stephen, right? 
he, he forsook many, many things. But did he receive specifically all of these exact things in his life while he's on this earth? He'll for sure get them in the next life. But I'm sure that God blessed Stephen in many, many different ways, right? Because his life was shortened. It seems to be that he was a younger guy. It's just kind of the impression that I get, being the deacon and everything. Uh, we're reading about his life and how it's recorded. But he, his life was obviously shortened. So everybody's life is not a cookie cutter. And God, will, God is just so he will weigh things out. But one thing that's always great that we can look forward to is... Specifically, if we look back at Isaac, even the blessing that Isaac received physically, what was greater? The blessing that he got then or the blessing that he'll get when he gets to the real kingdom? So one thing that we can all look forward to as Christians, when we see you know, Isaac getting a hundredfold, we see Isaac getting a hundredfold of sheep and of all of his possessions being multiplied a hundred times in his life. We get to the New Testament and we see that same promise being promised to us. If you were to be able to ask Isaac, who's in heaven now, dwelling with God, he's in the kingdom with God, what do you think that he would desire more? You know, to be in the true Canaan or to be in the temporary Canaan? Of course, the true Canaan. So the, we need to always keep, you know, uh, keep our, our sight on the things above. We need to always be looking for things above and not overly focusing on the things beneath. But let me say this as well. God will bless you. I said that to say this. God will, Isaac being an example, God will bless you with physical things. If, if you know, like I said, there are exceptions that if you keep God's commandments and you work hard in your life. You can look at so many different blessings in the Bible that are promised to those that are going to work hard. You can look at so many different examples of people that will labor hard in their life and they're righteous men like Job, for example, and what ends up happening? He grows to being a very mighty man, doesn't he? One of the greatest men in the East, I believe it says, right? Not only that, look at, look at Abraham. Abraham was not some chump. Abraham was like a prince. Abraham was regarded as like a highly, highly... He was like a trump. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this guy, had, Abraham had a lot of money, right? That was obviously... Abraham's looking back on dude. Take it back, right? <laughs> but Abraham, Abraham was a very highly, uh, uh, you know, respected man with a lot of possessions. In a physical sense, he had a lot of power and a lot of influence. He was so. Sometimes Christians, while they're dwelling on this earth, if they don't receive that hundredfold right away, and someone else does, they're like, "What am I doing wrong?" That's just how God weighs things out sometimes. So Stephen's a perfect example of that. But this is what you do. You always look forward, at least. Amen. You look forward to, well, you know, keep, there's a reason why the New Testament focuses on heaven, my friend. Because that's far greater than anything you can get on this earth in the first place. Amen. It's far better than anything that you could ever receive. The things on this earth that you see, they're temporary. Right. The things that are not seen, that's what's eternal. All the things that, that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and everything that you possess will be burnt up and won't even exist one day. Think about that. How much value can something like that really truly have? Nothing really, right? So hey, if you labor, if you work hard, God will bless you. You know, there are like and I always want to say the the, the exception, the caveats, and there are exceptions to that. You know, to where some people just keep laboring and for whatever reason, God just says, hey, what's best for you is not to, you know, to have a great amount of money. You have the proverb where, where um, you know, it says, in, uh, I can't remember exactly the chapter, like Proverbs maybe 20, 23 or something, where he says, give me neither riches nor poverty, right? And he says, Let, you know, at the end basically says this, let's not be fooled and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Maybe that's you and that's why he doesn't give you a lot of possessions. Maybe that's, maybe that's me. That's why I'm poor. No, I'm just kidding. No, but the, the, my point is this. There's reasons why people live more humble lives sometimes. And God has another will for you. But you know what? God will, God will give you that hundredfold later at least. God will give you that hundredfold when you get to heaven. And you know what? The, one of the great truths we can take away from what, everything that Isaac received and all the promises and the inheritance that he was promised, the true is in heaven. 
The true is what he received later, showing that it's that much greater. It was the temporary, that was just the picture. The true is always more fuller and greater than that. Go back to Genesis chapter number 26. So we see here that God was, was giving this blessing to Isaac. And what was the reason why he was receiving this blessing? Generation to generation. It's because of Abraham, if you remember. He's getting all of these things because of Abraham. Look at verse number 13. It says this, And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. You know what that means? He was powerful. That's the same thing I was thinking about. I was talking about Abraham being. Abraham was a powerful person. Isaac was as well. They were power. They had a lot of possessions. They had a lot of influence. They were powerful. I mean, this is just a fact when you read their lives. Look at verse number 14. For he had possession of flocks and possession of herds and great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. Notice that too. We're going to, I'm going to focus on another part here in just a minute. But this is very common. This is not something that's that's that, that's uncommon. But if you become if you become great, if you become powerful, if you are successful and God prospers you, many people will become envious of you. This is just a fact of life. This is not rare. This is common. We read this all throughout the Bible. Look at verse number fifteen. For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. Look at verse 16. And, it, and Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. So why is he saying this? Because they envy him. This, you can read, the very first contention in the Bible is envy. Do you know who? It's Abel and Cain. That's the very first major contention that takes place in the Bible. And why? Because he was envious of him. Jesus. Why does it say that he was delivered unto Pilate? Envy. That's what it says. It says that Pilate knew that they were that the Jews envied him. Um, Moses is another example. No. Moses and uh, um, what's their, what's their names? Korah, right? Why? Or or uh, Dathan and Abiram? Why? What was the reason? They're like, oh, we can all be like you, man. What's the reason? They envied him. You know, it talks about the Jews envying Paul. Uh, in the in uh, Acts uh, 17, it talks about uh, the Jews being envious of Paul because it's the it's the time when they when it talks about how they 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 hire under them or something uh, men of the baser sort. It, it, it specifically says because they envied Paul. That was one of the reasons why they did that, how the Jews envied him. This is very common when someone is successful or someone's doing great or, or maybe someone is spirit-filled. Probably when they saw Paul preaching the Word of God and he was coherent, what he said made sense. He's making all these points. People are being converted. He's had a successful spiritual ministry and people will look at you and become envious of you. This happens very, very often. This isn't something that's rare. It happens very, very often. So a person, if you plan on doing great things for God, you'll expect to have enemies because of that area. You can expect people to be envious of you. This is all throughout the Bible. And even we see it right here to the point of when, when Abimelech sees Isaac growing in power, he's just like, yeah, I don't even want you near me. He's telling him, leave, because you're mighty. It even says it. That had to be hard, right? You're mightier than us. Just leave, right? How ridiculous. We shouldn't be like that. We can learn from that bad mistake. Hey, be happy. If these are other brothers and sisters of Christ, why don't you be happy for their great works that they're doing? Why don't you be happy for their success? Why don't you be happy that God has blessed them and they're prospering instead of being an envious little brat? Why don't you, hey, God's blessing them for a reason, my friend. Yeah, God's giving them all these things for a reason. If it's God blessing them, He's doing that because He's just. And because, hey, maybe they're working hard. Maybe they're doing whatever it is. There's a reason why God's blessing them. So be happy for them. But if you want to be blessed by God, then you need to do some work. You need to do something that will earn God's blessing. That's what you need to do instead. And it's all. And oftentimes you'll see it's, it. Like, let's use an example of people at work. So often the people that are disgruntled are the people that are lazy. Right. So often the people that are envious of others are the people that don't work hard themselves. Right. So often. I can tell you example after example. When I worked for Cincinnati Bell, the telephone company, for three or four years, we were a union. We were CWA, which I am hardcore against unions. Right? Well, every time I heard of someone filing a grievance and a complaint through the union, every time it was the lazy workers. 
And you know who they were? They were the people that were always complaining about everyone else around them. They were the guys in the shop that every morning, they're like getting in arguments with everybody else and, and starting arguments with other people. And it's, it's always, if you look and you find a disgruntled or a lazy person, very, very often it'll be a person that's envious of other people at the same time. Both are true. An envious type of person, a person that envies another person, it's because they desire all the things that you have, of course, and they don't have them, but the reason they don't have them is because they're lazy and they don't work for them. Why don't you just get off your butt and work hard? Amen. And there's a reason why these people have these things. You know? Stop desiring the thing. It's, it's a sin in the first place to envy other people. To, to, to want to be like. That's what envy is. Covetousness and envy are, 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 are a, little, a little bit... They're very similar, but they're different things. Covetousness is desiring possessions, specifically, right? Envy is where you desire to be that person, or, or in that case. like More like the specifically, which is very weird. They're very similar. These things are very, very similar, but they're a little bit different as well. But it's here's the, stop wanting to be him. Stop wanting to be like him. And maybe why don't you just go to him and say, what did you do to get success like this? Amen. Why don't you just go to people at your company, if you want to do well at your company? Why don't you find the guy that you envy? Why don't you go to him and say, hey, what's your secret? How did you become so mighty, Isaac? What did you do to get all these things? You know what Isaac would say? You know, my father served the Lord. And I'm doing the same thing. And that's how. Yeah. Right? You know, they, they might give you the, the, the secret recipe to success is what they might give you. Yeah. You know, go to somebody. If, instead of envying people, do what they're doing. Pattern yourself after them. If you desire so much to be like them, and, and, and that's obviously we shouldn't just be seeking covetous things, right? right. That shouldn't be in the first, but I'm saying to be successful. We, we should be successful. Yeah. We should be good employees. Stop just being angry and just running at people that are working hard you know, because they have things and just work hard yourself. Amen. This is how people are more and more today. You know, people are just, you know, people are just losing character and integrity. And it seems like every year that goes by at every company that I'm at, it's like it's like it's moving like this, where the, the people that are like disgruntled and lazy are going like this, and all the good employees over here, and it's switching. It's getting worse and worse. You know. Christian people ought not to be like the world. We should be following that same path. We need to, we need to step up and be an example to other people. We need to step up and be successful. You know, this kind of preaching isn't preached on. I want to hit on this for a minute because a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, Christian churches and Baptist churches, they're not standing up and telling you to be a good worker. They're not standing up and trying to apply this to your life. And obviously the ladies can learn this as well. Not being envious of other people. And, and if someone, if you go into another lady's house and it looks nice, don't envy the house. If you go in, I'm just as far as cleaning things like that, right? You know, do what she's doing. Sweep the house up, clean the house up, do the work. Instead of being in, instead of envying someone, if, if she's doing something right, then just do what she's doing right. It's the same exact concept. If you see someone else that has something, that would be good, and I'm not saying covetousness, but that has something that would be good for you spiritually, if someone's reading their Bible or something along those lines, you shouldn't envy like, oh, she's she wakes up early every day. No, you should wake up early every day and read your Bible. Amen. And don't just get disgruntled. This is how people are, aren't they? They do do that. Whether you want to admit it or not, people are like this. They get upset because, you know why? You know why Abimelech wanted Isaac to go from him? Because you're mightier than me. You make me look bad. That's why. That's why people get mad at work and other workers. You know why they're mad and talking crap about everybody else? Because they're a crappy employee and when the, the, the good worker shows up, it's that much more obvious that you're crappy. That you're not a good worker. You know what you need to do is just do a good job. Amen. It's simple. Just be a good worker. Don't envy people. Don't, don't want to be like them. Just do right. Just do good. Right? <clears throat> we got a long chapter ahead of us. we got to move on from that. That's a good point, though. That's very important. Look at verse number uh, 17. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwell there. Now, there's two points I want to hit on at the same time. Right here while we're going down through here. Notice first that he left. There was a contention and he left. There's two things. I'm going to go ahead and tell you what they are and then we'll look at these quickly so we're not here all night. Number one is there needs to be a time when you know 
what battles to fight, and also when to stop fighting. Right? When to fight, what battle, what battles we should fight. Let's put it that way first. What battles we should fight, and what battles we should not fight. Because every fight and every battle is not worth it. Okay? There are some that are worth it, there are some that are not. Okay? So you need to know which ones to fight and which ones not to fight. Look at verse number 17 once more. It says, And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. Did he fight over this? Or did he just leave? That's the right thing to do. It's like, you got a problem with me? This is your land. I can go do what I'm doing somewhere else. I don't need to be here. So notice that. That's humility right there. It is. He could have been. He could have said it in land like, make me. Right? I'm staying here. This is my land. I have a lot. I'm set up here. I have this. You know, whatever type of company he's selling, buying things, I'm not going anywhere. You know what he did? He's like, I'll leave. Your land, I'll leave. That's humility. Look at the next verse, verse 18. And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. These are the wells, of course, that they just put earth in. Earth means dirt. So they put they, they filled these wells up, and now he's digging them again. It says this, For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham, and he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. You know what you see him doing here? I love this point. What you see, I've, pre- I've heard this preached like three or four times, and it's, it's, it's a powerful point. You know what Abraham had to do? There were certain, there were certain uh, uh, jobs that Abraham had to do. You think about it like this. There were certain jobs or there were certain fights that Abraham had to fight. You know what? Isaac, in the next generation, notice, generation to generation, had to do that same job, and he had to do that, fight that same battle. He had to fight that same fight. And this is how it works for us as well. The last generation, there were great soul winners. Jack Hiles was like, they were like the, the world, like, you know, I don't know how to put this, dynasty, let's say. Of all the Baptist churches of soul winning, specifically. That's what Hiles and, and his camp were known for, was soul winning. They put a lot of emphasis on soul winning, and it's super, super, super important. Amen. But Jack Hiles is dead, and he's not here anymore. And if no one else picks up that torch, you know what's going to happen? There'll be no soul winning. Jack Hiles is not going to live forever. He lives for one generation. Abraham lived for one generation. That well needed to be digged, right? And Abraham did it, but guess what? Abraham's gone. Now it's Isaac, and he has to dig the same well. The same exact well. Peter Ruffman. And yes, I said that Peter, no, I'm just kidding. That's what I'm to do. I'll say that right now, too. Just, you know, the cameras are running. And I'll tell you why I said that. Peter Ruffman, if I had to choose, if I had to choose, I believe both of them are 100% safe. But if I had to choose between Peter Ruffman and Jack Hiles of who is saved, I would go with Peter Ruffman all day long. All day long. You know why? My starting point is the gospel, and they both believe the right gospel. Both of them trust in the same thing. Peter Ruffman, I could give you literally five hours. Don't be stupid. I could give you five hours of preaching where he is just as clear as Jack Hiles on the gospel. Where he is like... I mean, it couldn't be any clearer. Just as clear. We're always. He's always just as clear. And if you find a couple confusing statements for Peter Ruffman, guess what? I got a couple stored on my computer to Jack Hiles, too. I'm serious. Everybody says stupid stuff sometimes. Okay? Both of them were just as clear on the gospel. What is someone saved by? What they're trusting in. Don't give me doctrine. You know, the Bible never st- it says that it's based upon the doctrine that you believe. Never. Not one time does the Bible ever say your doctrine determines your salvation. That's stupid, and there's misunderstandings of verses is why people come up with that. The Bible says you're saved by what you're believing in and what you're trusting in. So both of them believe the right gospel. But if I had to have a secondary, because I don't base people's salvation on their, on their doctrine that they believe but you know what my secondary is if I had to choose one? The King James Bible. Amen. Because what that actually means when it says means when it says, He that is of God, heareth God's word, you therefore hear them not because you're not of God. You know what he's saying? You don't know that the words that I'm speaking are God's word. He's not saying you understand doctrine. He's saying, I'm God and you don't understand my words, or you don't know that these words that I'm speaking are God's word because you don't know I'm God. That's what he's saying when he says that. That they're not able to identify the voice of the shepherd. 
same teaching, the exact same teaching in just a couple other chapters. You have Jack Kyles. A lot of people may not be aware of this, but Jack Kyles, I, numerous time, times corrected the King James Bible. Numerous times. Now, I believe Jack Kyles is saved. 100%. If I had to choose between Jack Hiles and Peter Ruffman, Peter Ruffman spent his life defending the King James Bible yeah. like no one ever has. Amen. Amen. He did far more for the King James Bible than Jack Hiles, that whole camp, Curtis Hudson, all of them ever have done. And a lot of these King James only, you know, independent fundamental Baptists, a lot of them that hate Peter Ruffman, this is just a fact. The reason why they are so strong King James only is because of Peter Ruffman. That's the whole reason. Right. There, was a, there was a tipping point amongst independent fundamental Baptists where a lot of, King, of uh, it wouldn't be King James only at that time, but a lot of independent fundamental Baptists in the 90s where a lot of them were straying away from the King James Bible. I mean a lot of them. Curtis Hudson sat on the board of like the, the, the new American Standard Bible or something. I don't know exactly which one it was, but he was on the, he was on the editor board of it. New King James. New King James of the New King James Bible. He was, I don't care your excuse. I've heard people's excuses. He sat on a board of, of and maybe he was just like an advisor. And you know why Jack Kyle's converted to the King James Bible? Because he said that he read one of Peter Ruffman's books. So all these people are like, Jack Hiles, Jack Hiles, Jack Hiles. And they're King James only, and then they hate Peter Ruffman. Well, the reason why you're King James only anyways, and your, you know, uh, whatever you want to refer to him as, your spiritual leader was King James only, is because of Peter Ruffman in the first place, moron. That's where you got it from. Because Jack Hiles repeatedly corrected the King James Bible. Now, that, that's enough. That was, the, you know, my point went on far longer than I wanted it to. But let me say this. The battles that both of those men fought, both of them were saved. Amen. But guess what? The King James Bible battle still needs to be fought today. Right. Peter Ruffman's dead and gone. But the King James Bible is still under attack. Right. So you know what somebody has to do is they need to step up into Peter Ruffman's place. They need to go back where Abraham was when he was digging that well and stand on that same rock and still preach that the King James Bible is the Word of God. Amen. Somebody else needs to stand up and remind people that Psalm 12, 6, and 7 is still in their Bible. Right. Somebody needs to stand up and remind somebody that Jesus, when he was being tempted, said that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Amen. Every word of God. Amen. So, Peter Ruffman's gone. Jack Kyle's is gone. But the same wells need to be dug, my friend. Right. And, you know, people yeah. still need to go soul winning. So, Jack Kyle's is dead. Abraham is gone. Isaac needs to come and go soul winning. Right. Amen. You need to go dig the same exact wells that were dug before in the last generation, generation to generation. So we need to we need to understand. Don't and don't keep looking to these people for everything. You need to step up and you need to be. See, they both have errors. So don't you know when I say this, don't think that I'm saying to do everything that either one of them did, right? You know, they they have their own problems, but people need to step up and they need to fill the gap that Peter Ruckman did for the King James Bible. Amen. People need to step up and they need to fill the gap that Jack Hiles did for soul winning. Amen. You need to stand up and do the things that the last generation did and stop talking about the last generation when they're still here. They're gone. Right. God bless them and thank them for everything that they did. And I'm thankful that you know I was taught that the King James Bible is the Word of God, and I'm sure it was, I know for a fact that it was because of Peter Ruffman's influence. I am thankful for that. But he's gone, and there's another generation just like when I was growing up coming that doesn't know that yet. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try to do the exact same thing he did, and I'm going to preach and teach the next generation, hey, the King James Bible is the perfect, preserved, inerrant Word of God. Amen. Fill the gap. Right. Generation to generation. Dig the same well that Isaac, that, that Abraham dug, Isaac. Good. Go back and dig the exact same well. Go soul winning. Amen. Defend the King James Bible. The same battles are being fought from generation to generation. There's nothing new. Notice that these are battles that are being fought. Look at what it says in verse 19. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And the herdmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. Notice these are battles that are being fought. They're striving. And they digged another well and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. And he removed from thence 
and digged another well, and for that they strove not, and he called the name of it Rehoboth. And he, and he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us, and, he, and we shall be fruitful in the land. One thing that you learn from that is persistence. Keep digging, keep digging, you keep digging. Amen. And then you'll get it later. You, it, everything doesn't, you don't just get fruit right away always. Sometimes you've got to keep trying, keep doing whatever you're doing. And then later on you're blessed in the end. The, the end is always better than the beginning. Look at verse uh, uh, 23. And he went up from thence to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared unto him in the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Look at this, generation to generation. Now he's appearing to Isaac. Fear not, for I am with thee, and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord. Doesn't that sound familiar? Generation to generation. And he pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants digged a well. Then Abimelech went to him from Gerar, and Ahazah, Ahazah, one of his friends, and Phicol, it's too similar to Phicol, and Phicol, the chief captain of his army, and Isaac said unto them, Wherefore come ye to me, seeing ye hate me, and have sent me away from you? And they said, We saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. And we said, Let there be now an oath betwixt us, even betwixt, betwixt us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee, that thou wilt do, that thou wilt do us no hurt, as we have not touched thee, and as we have, and as we have done unto thee nothing but good, and have sent thee away in peace. Thou art now the blessed of the Lord. And it says this, and he made them a feast, and they did eat and drink. Notice the forgiveness too. You notice it, and notice that he, what's he want? Look at look at the the end of that. In verse 31, And they rose up, beat times in the morning, and swear one to another, and Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. Amen. Notice how he forgave them, but notice there's certain battles that aren't worth fighting. See that again? Where it's just like, hey, you want those wells? Keep them. You notice that there were certain wells there, and he was like, just have that well. I'm, you know, you want me to get out of here, or? Okay, let's go, guys. There's certain fights that aren't worth fighting. There's certain fights that are worth fighting. King James Bible, so many these things that are worth fighting. The Godhead. Amen. There's certain fights that are worth fighting. And I will fight forever. Amen. Right? And you should be the exact same way. And fight tooth and nail. There's certain things that we should never give up on. Ever. Amen. Right? <clears throat> but right here, what do we see? It says they departed from him in peace. This was not worth it. It's just like, hey man, let's just put it behind us. You know, I understand. You're forgiven. Let's just have peace, right? We should try to live peaceably with all men, Romans 14 says, right? That's what we should do. So this is not a battle that's worth fighting. Use wisdom in your life, whether it's something that's worth, that, that God wants you to fight for, right? Look at verse 32. And it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they had digged, and said unto him, We have found water. Those are good words, isn't it? We have found water. And he called it Sheba. Therefore the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day. Verse 34. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Bashamath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, which were a grief of mine unto Isaac and to Rebekah. Now we see Esau's wife mentioned here and then a couple other times. And one time specifically, I'm going to spend some time on a comparison between his wives. Uh, there are two other mentions specifically, and it seems, and there are things like this in the Bible, that there is a discrepancy. The Bible's perfect, of course, and we can learn from the comparison. So just to put that in your mind, you can look them up yourself. Does anybody, do you remember the chapters? It's like 29? Uh, oh, is it in the very next chapter? 28. 28, okay, I thought it was a couple chapters out. 28, I think it's 28. Yeah, it's towards the beginning. Yeah, there it is. Uh, 36. Yeah, it's, it's 28 and 36. Yeah, yeah, I, knew, I thought it was 34. I couldn't remember. Yeah, uh, Genesis 28, verse 9, and then look at chapter 36. You can compare them yourself, uh, but I have my theory about them, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna going to go over that probably in the chapter 36, because it's, I believe chapter 36 is the one that's so called cooler uh, uh, listing of who they are. And there, there are ways, many, many different ways. Obviously, the starting point is the Bible is the Word of God. I've read every single word of it. And so these things are explainable, and you can learn from them is what you can do. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you so much for the King King Bible. We thank you for the